Welcome to another episode of the Say Network podcast. I'm Megan, and I'm here with Jim Sparks. Hello. Abraham Guevara. Hello. So if you've been in the Salvation Army for a while, chances are you've probably seen one of the videos, story pieces, or documentaries from Share Change. They tell and share some of the most inspiring stories that we've seen in the Salvation Army. And on today's episode, we're actually going to sit down with a few members of the Share Change team to learn more about what inspires them personally and what their process is like for choosing stories. So today we have with us Josh Cowing, the Director of Multimedia Ministries. Hello, Megan. Hey, Josh, how long have you been directing Multimedia? Uh, the department started in uh, 2007, and so I've been uh, in that position for 12 years. Jeez, almost 13. Awesome. And then we also have with us Chris Toy, who's a producer for Chair, Chair Change. Chris, um, some of you might remember um, Chris from his youth department days, where he used to be our multimedia producer for the youth department. Yes. And Chris, how long have you been with Chair Change? Um, I've been with Share Change, I think, since 2012. Seven years, I think. Seven years? Awesome. Yeah. And then we also have with us Jeff Prawl, who is also a producer for Chair Ch- Share Change. I don't know why I can't say that today. Chair Change. Uh, Chair Change. Chair. Chair just, change. It's, it's a different department. <laughs> yeah. We ought to just change the, the name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jeff, how long have you been with Share Change? Uh, just a few months after Chris, I think. Yeah. 2012. Awesome. Before we get into the interview, we want to just take a minute and talk a little bit about youth culture. So Jim, what do you have for us? Today I have a fun little blog post that Kara Powell uh, created for Youth Specialties. And it is um, 12 skills every 12th grader needs before they move away from home. Mm, So I thought that was interesting. Can you guys guess a few of these? You guys, uh, you guys all have no. been past this stage. This is going to be helpful because I have a soon-to-be 12th grader in my house. Yeah. Mm. My there's, a, there's several of these that she's going to need to learn. Okay, so what? number one on our list for her right now is driving. Driving is... Is that on the list? A form of it is using Uber, Lyft, or other means of public <laughs> transportation. <laughs> Never thing, mind yeah. learning to drive? No. no. Drive. All there, that does no is support my daughter's contention that she does not need to get her driver's license, which I do not understand. Well, 2019. It's, in Los Angeles. it's very possible she won't. It's 2019. What else? Are you just tell me. The How idea. to open a bank account? Bank account. Yeah, manage a budget. Yep. Cooking. Using an a- sorry, using an ATM, conducting banking online, and exchange money or on Venmo or PayPal. I was going to say cooking ramen. <coughs> yes, especially. I, I ramen. agree with the cooking. Yeah. Ramen. Uh, cooking. The importance yes. of uh, learn how to debt. cook a few simple meals. Yeah, that's good. Um, laundry skills. Number one. Number one. Wow. Including, wow. Well, it's not in that's particular from order. Mother. It's not in particular order, but oh. that's the number one bullet. Yeah. Uh, including their bed sheets, exclamation mark. That's a mother. Yeah, <laughs> that's the mom part coming in. That's <laughs> a real mother. <laughs> yep. Proper baby. Do the laundry and your bed sheets. Don't forget. I just buy new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah. You're the reason we have to have lists like this, Chris. And Uber. All right, here's the list. <laughs> do laundry, including their bed sheets. Wash the dishes and do basic house cleaning. You, By the way, they should... They really should be able to accomplish that. If your kids aren't doing house cleaning at all, at all, until they leave the house, yeah, you you failed as a parent. You have other problems. Use an ATM machine, conduct banking online, and exchange money on Venmo or PayPal. Manage a budget. Perform basic first aid. Oh, Mm -hmm. all Commissioner Sunbeams. Well, I've already done that. Hmm. Hang a picture. A skill that many college freshmen lack, but almost all need. Which is interesting. Hang on, we don't even get to do that in our office. Did you hang up? No, did you hang up pictures in college? Yeah, with uh, what's the blue? blue Yeah, right, posters. Yeah, you not hang a picture like with a nail in the wall, like command strips. (laughs) It's command strips now. We weren't allowed to. There are stud finders, but that's a different college issue. See what I did? I see what you did there. Make healthy eating choices at the school cafeteria. Uh, uh, Just. Just eat. How else are you going to get your freshman 15 if you're right. making healthy choices? <laughs> They're not going to accomplish that goal. No. Grocery shop with a budget. That's good. Cook with a, uh, cook a few simple meals. Good. Ramen. Change a tire and understand routine car maintenance, especially if they own a car. I don't know if I agree with the changing the tire. Uber. I have never changed a tire. 
Everyone should know how to major, change a tire. Well, how does that it's line so up with easy. Uber? That's my question. Oh. How does cooking line up with cafeteria? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Carapal. Well, yeah. There's some I we might some, hear us. There's a little bit of inconsistency. Should I give her a call? You might need to. Sure. Sounds like no, it. No, no please don't. Take care of we have some discrepancies <laughs> have some issues. Identify one adult they can call or text in a crisis. Mom. That's pretty good. I mean, sure. if your kid's going to school quick. away from your area. Do you area, think she means somebody local? Yeah. In a crisis, you need someone to, like, yeah. like uh, Not an emotional when crisis. Megan's car <laughs> breaks down again, then yeah. she doesn't she has someone how to, to change a tire. Right. I've since got rid of that car, just FYI. <laughs> That's how you solve your car you problems. Yeah, you couldn't change the tire, so you got rid of the car. No, <laughs> no. Like Chris couldn't, <laughs> couldn't wash his clothes, so he just bought new ones. Bought new ones. Yeah. Is, is basic first aid um, pulling out your cell phone to record them when they're hurt? Is that that's what they taught probably. us? Probably. That's, that's, that's what they taught us well, in the first aid course. We yeah. I think. I think given the time we live in, that probably could go into all of these. Right. It's true. You know, like step one. Hashtag. Even the, using the ATM machine, you're going to take a selfie saying hashtag adulting. Right. It's right. True. Paying Hasht- a bill. Yeah. Hashtag pin. Yeah. Pin number. <laughs> anyway, thought it was good. Something that we should think about. Wait, and, what uh, are the last three on the list? Last three were change a tire, use Uber, and identify one adult. Oh. Hmm. Is that 12 things? That was 12. Oh. I went through all of them. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Uh, I don't. I I never thought about any of this before. <laughs> At twelve, I was like, no, like, it's not your job to think of it. It's, the, it's that's mom and dad's job. I guess that's true. But we don't think of it either. <laughs> yes, <laughs> until it's too late. You're like, oh my gosh, you don't know anything. How are we going to release you into the world? I feel like the biggest shock for me was rent. <laughs> like how much it was? How just that I like I was like, yeah, I have money. I'm not living with mom anymore. There goes all my money. Right. You know, you just hand over all. And your it money. keeps coming every month. Yeah, and I was like, what is this? It keeps coming to me. I was laughing. Uh, what, uh, a kid at our core uh, got his paycheck, his first paycheck, and was like, they took out almost half in taxes, <laughs> and he was just angry, just outright angry. What even is I remember FICA? That. Yeah. No, but they give it back later. Yeah, he was really, really angry. I remember that phase. I was very angry, and then yeah. eventually it kind of gets past anger to just acceptance. And then ambivalence. That's how they get you. Yeah. And, and then you stay like that for the rest of your life. Sad, <laughs> yeah. sad acceptance. That's what we call the sheep mentality. <laughs> <laughs> just Don't be sheep. Wake up, people. Nice. Invest in your 12th graders. Get them ready for when they leave. And it's not just the parents' job. It's all of our jobs. You know, uh, it's my job. Recently, I've been hearing, uh, uh, it's funny because this kind of goes into like not only preparing them, obviously, for things they need to, to survive, but uh, preparing them spiritually. Uh, and uh, and uh, recently, I've been hearing a sermon on this whole thing about like uh, kids are kind of getting confronted with or kids are asking tougher questions. We were just talking about this. Mm. Kids are starting to ask tougher questions when it comes to religion. They're not just, um, you know, I was, when I was a kid, it was like, is this a sin? Now it's like, is there even sin? Is that even oh. a, a concept, you know? And so, they, I mean, this is where they're, where they're at. And I think even, I mean, I'm going to, I'm not going to out spiritual Carapal, but I do think um, those are, finding sort of the main like they should it'd be cool to see a list of like the main theological things that you need to prepare your 12th grader for well it's yeah. interesting that you brought that up because you just buy her book called growing young which Boom. we have in of course, our department sticky faith. Yes. Sticky faith. covers yeah. all of that sweet this is a just link. a fun little blog post <laughs> in addition to that yeah link in the show notes all right well before we start uh with the interview i was wondering really quickly if um you could just share with our listeners anyone who might not be familiar what is share change and and I mean, how does how does your team kind of function within ShareChange? Uh, ShareChange is a, an initiative of the USA Western Territory. That is, um, it was the 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 original concept came from Commissioner Jim Nags when he was still in our territory, and he was asking the question about what is the modern day open air in the Salvation Army. We have this tradition of doing open air meetings where everyone in the core would march out of the core and set up in the in the park or in the uh, town square or the marketplace or wherever and do like an open air meeting with with singing and preaching, and then they would sort of get the attention of everybody, and then kind of march them all back into the core and have a, a Salvation Meeting there. We don't really do that very much anymore in the Salvation Army, in part, I think, because those public spaces have kind of disappeared. 
uh, in the in our in our physical worlds and in our neighborhoods. Um, but his question was, do those places maybe still exist somewhere online? And is there is there a way that we can put together pieces that are attractors that uh, that will draw people to them, that will also let them know a little bit about what we're about, so that we can bring them back to the Salvation Army and say, here's what Salvation Army has to offer you on, on a variety of levels. So when we um, when we started making these pieces um, with Share Change, that we kind of went to that concept and thought, how how do we do that using video? Uh, if the online world um, is uh, is 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 a manifestation of our physical world in a way, the attractor in that is video. Video is sort of king uh, in terms of online and, and getting people's attention. And we felt like the modern day marketplace, the modern day location for the open air are places where people go every day. People don't go to the market every day anymore, or the town square anymore, but they go to Facebook every day and they go to YouTube every day. And so if we can have a presence there uh, and use these video pieces as attractors to share some part about what the Salvation Army is or, or what we're about, then perhaps we can entice them to connect with us on a, on a deeper level as well, either because they need help or because they want to help uh, or they just want to know more about who we are and what we're about. So that's really how it started and, and, and it still continues to be, I think, our driving goal in, in all of these pieces that we create. That's great. Um, I know I've seen several of the share change videos, and I think they're they're all, all the ones I've seen are really inspiring. I'm wondering um, what inspired you to get into film yourself. Uh, that's a good question. We should probably all answer that because um, I think we all spent some time in film school, at least. Uh, for me. Uh, I started paying attention to film when I was in high school and my small town that I lived in would close up the doors and the sidewalks at six o'clock uh, every night. And so the only thing to do as a, as a teenager was to go see movies. And so I started to go see a lot. And I've always been attracted to story and the power of film in particular as a medium to transport you uh, through time and space to connect you with these characters that you see on screen is to me unparalleled in terms of other other art forms um, and that is true whether it's a, a, a narrative piece that's fictional or something that's documentary in nature it doesn't matter if you've never seen this person before on screen that you're watching this video um, once you start watching it and listening to their story it connects you to that person in a way that that nothing else really can and so for me there's there's real power in that and and power to convey story and message and so i love the fact that we are able to use those tools to do exactly that um, for a, a cause that's you know that's pretty important this might be a topic for another podcast but what's your favorite film that one we do all have to answer mine is raiders of the lost ark I loved it when I was a kid, and I loved it even more when I was older and realized that the story that it was telling was much deeper than I realized as a kid when it was just snakes and boulders. Uh, the fact that there was something deeper happening there, and even something spiritual in a way, uh, to me was a revelation. And it was the first time that I really realized that, that uh, what I was watching was really good and I could explain why. And so for me, that, that's, I think that's probably been my favorite of all time. Uh, Chris, Jeff, um, what inspired you to get into film, and do you have a favorite film? I mean, I fell in love with Star Wars and James Bond movies and wanted to make those. And uh, so now I work for the Salvation Army. So <laughs> obviously it's basically what we're doing yeah, is James, kind of a, James Bond and sci-fi. Yeah, it's pretty much a straight line for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a, a favorite, just a favorite film. But yeah, Star Wars was really uh, uh, inspiring to me. Um as a child and how I got into filmmaking, um, was, you know, we, you always had a video camera and we're just messing around with it. And then, you know, we just had a, uh, we just started getting good at it. And, um, and then as I was, you know, coming to college and I needed to choose a major, um, I was seeing that this form of communication was really a powerful one. And that's, that's what I like to be a communicator and, and, making a film is is the way I can you know express a message and share is is there um, a certain type of story that's maybe had the biggest impact on you a certain type I can think of a couple examples yeah, of ones examples. that we have done um, that affected me more than maybe I had anticipated um, there's one in particular that Jeff directed um, called that we called Lost Vegas 
and it was about Dooley, um, a, tr- a member of the trans community who had come to the Salvation Army for shelter. Um, she was homeless. She didn't have anywhere else to go. Um, and the Salvation Army gave her a place that was safe to be. And it's easy to make generalizations about large swaths of, of our community, I think, um, and also the community of people that the Salvation Army serves. Um, but again, when you hear someone's story out of their own mouth, it allows you to see it through their eyes and experiencing in a different way. And so for me, that, that really sort of uh, affected me in um, helping me understand uh, all of the things that led to where this person is now and the fact that I now get to be a part of the solution to help them kind of get back on their feet is really profound. Uh, it's what I like. One of the things I like most about these stories that we get to tell is it's it makes you proud to be part of the organization that that services these individuals and, and uh, allows you to be part of the solution, not just a part of the problem. I don't know. Was that a big deal for you, that piece, Jeff, or less so than for me? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I think it was just really... I don't know. It was really special to see um, the organization coming together uh, to work with such a uh, un- underserved um, group, um, and to, to learn about that and to see the, the the sort of the genuine relationships that were created out of it um, was something that I, I thought was really special. Um, and and the the pure dedication to it of of the import- placing the importance of a person in need. Um, above yeah anything all else yeah anything else anything it's in a their person who needs help mm-hmm. and we're gonna do whatever we need to do and so they set up a separate you know transgender dorm um, because um, transgender homeless run into a lot of issues that um, that your other ho- homeless don't run into uh, especially with shelters that they end up um, that there's they, a lot of times they don't get let into either the male or the female shelters um, and so there's all kinds of stories of them you know just sleeping in the hallways and a lot of times getting thrown out and all these kinds of things. And I don't know if this is still the case, but when we did that a couple years ago, there were some statistics that, um, that, uh, transgender homeless were the most at risk population of all homeless that they were, that the highest, um, murder rate was, uh, amongst homeless was, was transgender. Um, and so, um, Salvation Army set up a specific dorm just for transgender, um, people that didn't have to, so they, they were able to have a special safe place that w- they didn't have to deal with. Um, where do we go and which one do we go to? And, all, you know, that kind of thing is just this is a place where you can feel safe, where you can feel at home, where you can feel cared for. Um, and the staff um, took that on uh, w- very genuinely. Um, and it was really fun to see. It, w- it was cool. And I think it was important. It was. We were a little nervous about that, too. I'll just tell you one other story about it. Um, we were worried about um, getting the tone right and getting the messaging right, because that uh, can be a, a touchy subject, I think. And so we showed it to administration at Territorial Headquarters pretty pretty early on once we were done with it to sort of make sure that we were not speaking out of turn. Um, and we showed it in cabinet to, to everybody who's on administration. Uh, and at the end of it, there was total silence. And we didn't know how to take that exactly. Um, but then the commissioner said, what strikes me is that this response is one that Jesus would have that we're treating this individual the way that Jesus would. And that was, I mean, that, that's probably as, as best a, as affirmation as you can get. And so that made us feel like, all right, so we, we managed to strike the right chord in this, and we're telling this in the, in the proper way, in a way that it's to, to allow us to see this person the way that Jesus would. I love that. I think that's such a great example, um, not just of what Jesus, you know, would do, but also um, the Salvation Army's mission, you know, to, to you know, um, give these, be, what is it, meet, meet, human need uh, yeah, in the name of Christ without discrimination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just love that. I think that's a great example. Um, in all the documentaries that I've seen you guys put put out, um, they've all been really great quality. I think they're just really intriguing and they really tell a story and they, they, they tell that story, which I think is um, is really cool. What motivates you to put your your best foot forward or to to, um, t- to really put forward the best documentary possible or the, the best story or the best um, piece forward? Well, of course, you want to do our best, you know, for God's glory. <laughs> um, but uh, this is, you know, it's what we do, no matter what you are, uh, what your job is as a craftsman, uh, that we want to do the best in our craft. And, and, and 
for the sake of the story. So whatever message we're trying to convey, we want to tell it in the best way possible to engage the most and to have the most effect so that they get it. Um, so we've been fortunate in this department to have a certain amount of resources, but not only that, um, our staff, our, our crew, um, know how to use it <laughs> properly because we've all been trained. We've all done this, um, a lot. Uh, we, we all went to school for it, uh, film. And so knowing the right techniques and, uh, uh, just being able to pair that with, uh, identifying the proper stories, you know, and, and that's why, uh, the Dewey story is, a um, that they mentioned was, is a good example of that is because, uh, it's like a David and Goliath where, you think there's this giant and then the more marginalized, you know, they are or um, the, you know, the deeper you get in, in, you know, as we hit rock bottom, the harder you hit, the greater the redemption. And so it's more satisfying and more inspirational because you're like, oh, if they can do it, you know, I can overcome too. So um, that's the kind of story we want to get go for. And if we, you know, if as it is with anything, if we do it, um, you know so so or if we don't really take time take the the effort to make that story communication perfect then it'll never you know deliver i think he who is faithful in little is faithful in much i think is um something that uh you know has always come back to me it's the idea that um you know we because we have projects that run the gamut that's something the ones that are big the ones that are small no matter what um we are specifically with the documentaries we are covering the stories of people who are actively at work, sometimes giving Herculean efforts on the ground to to do the kind of work that they do. And if we don't put everything that we have into trying to um, put it together the best way that we can, then we're doing a disservice uh, to them. Um, we're doing a disservice to them, but also to um, just to, to their work, but also to the time that they take to allow us to come out there and you know get all up in their daily business as they try to do their work and and that kind of thing. And so I think I think it's really important. And like Chris said, I think it's um, you know I think we I we're all strong believers in the idea that um, quality the quality of the production um, impacts the connection and the watchability. Um, of it, and so if you have something that's a much higher quality, you're much more likely to 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 watch it, to sit through it, to connect with it, and to be able to engage with the the the, the story that's being presented. And so it's important that we do our best as storytellers um, to be able to be uh, creative and to try to come up with new and unique and um, high quality ways to be able to present the work. Um, in the hopes that that is just you know it's it's all just prevent presenting as many trying to tick all the boxes, uh, as many of the boxes as you can to help the story and the message come through to the person who's watching it. And if one of those boxes is the quality of it, then that's what we, you know, then it, I think we think it is. That's one of the things we try to do. It's summed up in a, a phrase from film school, a good story, well told. It can't just be a good story. You have to be able to tell it right. So if our form, our medium is film, then it has to, you know, be good, good looking at, at, you know, we can't just have bad lighting and, and stuff like that. A good story, well told. So what is the criteria for a good story? There we go. Good story, beginning, middle and end. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's, we can, we can do a master's program on that. Um, let's keep breaking it down. Yeah, beginning, uh, I think end. that's true. Um, we, in narrative filmmaking, um, with characters in particular, they're looking for some kind of arc, like Chris says, sort of beginning, middle, and end. This person started here, all these things happen, and throughout that journey, that led them to this sort of resolution. And so we sort of look for those in the pieces that we do as well, um, whether they're narrative or, or documentary in nature. We're looking for sort of a, 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 an arc that shows a progression of some kind. Um, we share... So we look for stories of transformation, of people who have had a transformative encounter with Jesus, hopefully as experienced through the extended hand of the Salvation Army. Those are the ones for us that are like easy, easy yeses. Um, we, we find them through other Salvation Army story outlets, through the New Frontier or through Caring. Um, we hear them anecdotally from people as we're sort of around in the Salvation Army world. And 
every so often one of them will just kind of click with us and be like, that's something interesting. That's something that we haven't really explored before. Or I have an interesting way to tell that story. I think it kind of, there's, it's not easy to define what one specific thing will hit, but there will be something in that story that we hear that goes, ah, that's something that we can do something with. And so then it sort of starts the, the development process from there. Hmm. So you get your story, then what's the next step? Um, Usually it's to try and make sure that we know that that is a good story. So there's lots of interviews that these guys will do ahead of time. Uh, they'll talk to the, the, per the people involved. They'll talk to the officers involved or anybody else um, to try and help figure out what that arc is, what that storyline, how we're, what storyline we're actually going to present. We sort of have the big picture story and then we sort of figure out what is the little narrative that we're going to try and tell through all of that. So there's lots of, lots of interviews ahead of time. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, planning, logistical work that happens uh, leading up to it as well. Now, how do you guys convince people to get on camera? Getting on camera is not easy, particularly if like documentary type stuff. They're not actors. They don't. That's not their life ambitions. Yep. Most people are very uncomfortable. So how do you how do you navigate that process? They're probably really vulnerable, right? Like on camera as well. It's it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty wide variety. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, think about yeah. like how hard it is for us to get people to give a testimony in a meeting, right? Yeah. Stand up and say something, and yeah. it's gone. Like yeah. you say, it and it's gone, and those two hundred people hear it, and it's yeah. gone. Here, it's immortalized in a lot of way. Yeah, I think um, at least for from my experiences, I haven't had. I mean, it's happened a couple times, but there haven't been too many times where it's been a lot of trouble getting people to go along with the idea of being on camera. But the thing that we that I is a big hurdle to get over is feeling comfortable on right. camera. Yeah. Um, like they'll say, like, yes, we'll do it. But then, you know, if you just show up and you sit down and you do the interview right away, um, the results aren't very good because it's it's hard. It's hard, especially because especially when we the cameras are big. Yeah, and big the lights are out of pressure. It's staring you in the face. Yeah, it's and, big old camera. Know, we got the mic kind of hanging over. Huge bright lights in your face. Right. Yeah. So so we just you got to start getting them comfortable. I got to say that uh, from the videos I've watched, the people look comfortable. Like and and I know, like I know what you guys have there. So mission accomplished. Like you know. Right. Right. So the goal is you know. To get them comfortable, you just start talking to them, you know, just start engaging, have a conversation. Even before you start rolling is what Way you're before saying, right? you start yeah. rolling, yeah. You have that relationship first. Way before, right. I think, yeah, and I think we, we usually try to, you know, you kind of feel it out with a person because some people are different, you know, have different levels of comfort. There's officers who have been in, um, I think, so, you know, communication media roles and stuff yes. like that. And you can just sit down with it like John Murray. <laughs> just <laughs> rattle it off like it's <laughs> nothing. Do nothing. Yeah, there's plenty. Yeah. But then, you know, there's but then there's obviously a lot of people who haven't. And so, yeah, like Chris saying, it's about I think it's about creating a relationship and if, uh, like hoping that they can feel comfortable with you. And then the side of it, you know, the side uh, benefit of that is that you actually a lot of times I've become friends with the, the people that um, that we've interviewed, mm -hmm. like they become friends and I've stayed in contact with them and stuff like that. And that happened because, you know, you go into it to try to create a relationship that they can feel comfortable on camera. But, you know, like they're, they're like really enjoying talking with them yeah. and then a friendship comes out of it. But but it makes a big difference because I think the idea is that then they feel like they can talk to you. Because I think that's the idea that you're trying to try to create is that connection between you and the person in front of the camera that we're just talking. Right. Just right. Talk They're to not me. talking to the camera or the lights that's or the, the other microphone. Thing. That's They're the other talking thing. to you as an individual. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. The camera's off to the side a bit, and we're actually sitting right next to the camera as close as we can to them <laughs> so that, you know, it's not too intimidating. And they're just looking us in the eye, and then we're just talking to them and just saying, go ahead, just talk to me. You know, and then hopefully it's a little more comfortable. And then uh, one time, I think, uh, well, at least one time we did it where where we we had a couple of officers that were really, um, uh, really well spoken and really comfortable on camera. And so we did set up a thing where they were looking directly into the camera. Um, but we put it we put a a uh, uh, like a teleprompter reflection um, of an iPad, which was uh, stream. What, what was it? it? Was on Skype or like FaceTime or whatever with, with the me yeah. huh. behind the camera. So I was talking into a camera facing me, yeah. which was then skyping to the iPad, which was then playing. So they were looking at like a presentation of my face yeah. over the camera. That's interesting. Um, to try and help them talk to them. Did, that did way. it work? How did that it work? worked? Yeah. But it, what we wouldn't have done it with anybody. We did it, it with them anybody. because they yeah. were really comfortable with it. Hmm. 
And so it was fun. And you get a cool look because then, then you're looking right into right. the camera. And stuff, it, so. I would imagine the demeanor would change mm -hmm. on a person the second that they're talking. They see a human face. Yep. Yeah. You know? It would never have worked if they had just been looking at the black lens. Right. Staring into a dark hole. The abyss. <laughs> never anybody. Yeah. yeah. And so you you create the story. Uh, you find the story. You're creating the story. You have a kind of a story arc in which you want to do and then you get the person comfortable, but inevitably, when they get comfortable and they maybe start telling their story, things change, and you might see something else. Is th has there been times where things have changed, and the whole storyline's like this is not what we were going for, and it's gone in maybe a better direction or a worse direction? Like, hey, maybe we just maybe we just keep editing that for another ten years or whatever. <laughs> you know? Changes all the time, yeah. There, yeah. There's probably examples of all of those that we can come up with. There's some that have not been finished for a couple of years because for a lot of reasons, but because it didn't really come together the way that we had hoped or something changed in the situation. There's been stuff that we've done a lot of pre-production on that by the time we were ready to shoot it, the program didn't even exist anymore. Um, but certainly I think, and you guys can probably think of better examples than I can of this, um, the story that we thought we were going to get going into it was not necessarily the one that we got coming out of it. Or other times, maybe an even better example would be, as we went through that story, we discovered other little side stories that were just as compelling, that were like offshoots of that main story. And a few times, we've, we've shot pieces where we've interviewed person as sort of a secondary interview, and their stuff was so good and their own story was so good, that turned into a standalone piece on its own as well. Mike Delgado is the one that I'm thinking yeah. of specifically like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, where he was secondary to this interview of a, of a guy that Mike had discovered sleeping behind the core who had an incredible story of, of recovery. Um, but Mike's own story of recovery ended up being so compelling that we shot a whole piece on him and his family as well. Yeah, and then one on his daughter too. And then later one yeah. on his daughter, yeah, yeah, who was part of that same, in that same mess of addiction that affects whole families. Um we're always willing to try and follow those sort of stories where they lead because everybody's story is incredible. And uh, when, you know, we find something like that, that we kind of cue into, we have the, the freedom and the flexibility to be able to pursue those as well. Yeah. How do you know it's good? Like, how do you know, like, uh, I'm, uh, it's a weird transition, but like Adele said that she knows when her song, when she's recording a song, is going to be great is when she starts crying through it. <laughs> same thing. Like, so, <laughs> so I was curious. <laughs> the whole post sounds, <laughs> sounds like a joke. But it's is, the same thing. Is there a way for you to be like, man, that we imagine. this is this is you have significant. To you do have to feel it. Yeah. So it is. It is quite the same. <laughs> you're bet, you're yeah. like listening to what they're saying. It can be down to a specific quote, even yeah. from right where you hear a single line from somebody as they're shooting. And you're like, "That's it, right there." As we're shooting, we're editing in our heads. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're taking every sound bite that we hear and seeing how, uh, how how assembling it in our heads, saying, mm, "We're also lacking this, so we'll ask another question." You know, maybe tell me more about your childhood and then stuff like that. But uh, you really have to feel it out. And you get you get there by 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 knowing them through the pre-interviews yeah. and the discussions with them he ahead of time because it's it's a fine balance because you're you're, you're generally you're not wanting them to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, say everything to you off camera that you want them to say on camera. But I think that pales in comparison to the importance of being prepared for the interview and being prepared to be able to have the conversation with them. And I think that's I think that's sort of a, a, a you know. I guess I would say like a rookie fear kind of, of like, oh, you know, save that for the camera or whatever. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. But like do your homework, do your discussions with them and then and then have a conversation and let them sort of steer you and allow, you know, f have follow up questions like the, to, to, to cover things, but allow your knowledge of their story and what you're trying to accomplish in your head um, guide you to making sure you know you covered everything and once you do that then the interview can be done but we, we've talked about that a lot for authenticity's sake too yes. these are people's stories we don't want them to be our stories or the version yes. of their story that we like best we want to bring out their story mm -hmm. and so at every turn and we've had a lot of discussions about this we want to make sure that what we're doing is authentic mm. and also feels authentic and i think that's one of the ways we do it is you know their story well enough that you can allow them to tell it, and then you just sort of mine in a couple other areas as need be. But really, the story is theirs. 
Yeah. I know this isn't one of the questions on here, but I was curious. Um, we so didn't you approve guys, this question. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm talk to my agent right and, now. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys go through all that, and you guys are you guys are embedded in it because you have got that relationship and stuff. But generally, as I understand it, you guys shoot something, and then you give it to editors to go and edit, and they're not always. And they don't have the relationship that you guys have. Has there been moments where to, uh, some of the team members on the editing staff have just been like, holy smokes, like, or saw something completely different than you guys didn't see and had a different emotional impact? Because it's weird that you're watching something. I've always found it weird for editors. They're, they're not, like, emotionally invested in this. Uh, a friend of mine's an editor. He's not emotionally invested in it. He's just cutting it up to try to make the best story uh, available. Uh, has, has that happened at all? Or? Uh, I think it's, you know, just like I said, I'm editing it in my head while I'm sitting there with them. Um, the editor has to have a certain sensibility as well that they, they know story structure, um, what's emotionally compelling, uh, where to put certain details. So it, it's kind of half and half. So I, when we work with the direct, uh, editors, um, I kind of let them do their thing because I, like you said, I like to see. Uh, their perspective and maybe there's a surprise that they the, an insight that they see that I may have missed and then after after I see their initial pass and I, then I kind of um, communicate with them even more on on different things I think are missing but um, it's it's cool to have another perspective on it yeah. in that sense I think it's an important aspect of it I, I, you know I think it, for me it depends a lot of times on how uh, clear of a picture in my head I have of what I want um, what I'd like the piece to, to, to come out like. If I'm very, very specific on it, um, then I kind of will like lay it out ahead of time for them of like, this is kind of what I want. Um, but I, I think, you know, but there's a number of pieces where you don't have that going into it. And then, and regardless, you have to, I think there's, it's important, like Chris said, to, to leave that opportunity open because they're sort of, what's the, the, the they're the final writer. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, of, yeah. It's, and, especially for test documentary. Yeah. Because as opposed to a scripted piece, mm -hmm. when we go to shoot testimonies in people's d documentary style, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. We don't know what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. So it's, we don't have it, you know, completely scripted what, what we want it to be. It a lot like of times. Sorry, it seems like there needs to be a level of humility uh, as the person crafting the story. Yeah. Because I would yeah. imagine that if this is the, what I want the story, you, you hear a story and you initially have like ideas in your head. And then when you go there, you got to have to like accept whatever's happening in a way. That's the cool part about filmmaking. It's a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. So everybody has, you know, uh, uh, can see it from a, a different perspective. And it's always good to pull from that mm -hmm. because, you know, um, uh, filmmaking takes a lot of people to put together. You need camera lights, you need editors and directors and producers. Um, but yeah, when you, when you are able to get past your ego yeah. <laughs> and just, you know, let, let other people communicate, then, then you get insight from everybody and yeah. it's just better. Yeah. It helps that our, our two full-time editors, Brittany and Bree, uh, and then to some extent Elliot as well, who also does some editing for us in addition to a lot of other things are excellent storytellers in their own right. So it makes it very easy to trust them. If you don't really know exactly where you're going with a piece, mm. you can hand it over to them and say, see what you can do with this. And then, uh, you can kind of work from there because they, they both are, are, uh, very capable. And so it's, it makes that part a lot easier. Yeah. Awesome. Were you going to say something? I, I cut you off. Don't remember. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, man. That's okay. <laughs> uh, this ne uh, these next questions, uh, uh, the reason I want to ask him is because I want people to appreciate what goes on on the day of a shoot. Um, but how long does it typically take to like for you guys to set up a shot, like an interview, just basic interview, you know? And how much work is that in terms of like time and everything? Set up an interview. I mean, it depends on the complexity of it. Sometimes it can be a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. It it depends because when we're going on location, we we sometimes are able to scout ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But if we're not, then we're like looking around and we're like, uh, "There's nowhere to do an interview here. <laughs> There's nowhere <laughs> like over here. It's too noisy by the street. Uh, we hear all these cars passing by. Over here, the light." is terrible like it's a dark room and stuff like that so the more lights we have to set up the longer it's going to take so usually we allot um an hour or two to do that and and that also comes down to like crew size mm -hmm. uh, in that 
people may be wondering, well, it's just, you know, they're just sitting down as an interview. How many people do you need? Well, how long do you want to take to set up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, anything can be done by one person if they have enough time. So in order to be uh, the most efficient we can, um, you know, I, I have a crew of about four uh, of us and we set up the camera, light, sound, and it takes about an hour or two hours. It really depends, and uh, uh, you know, it depends. Is it the depends. answer we it, say it, for it, it does. It does. But like, but like on uh, you know, the Verdugo's interview, we spent an entire day pre-lighting mm. that. Hmm. I think there was just there might have only been three of us, but we spent ten hours. And that was in a studio space, mm-hmm. and just as long on the neurofeedback one as well, which had yeah. a very specific lighting effect. That's right. Like if it's a standard sort of three-point light setup. Probably it takes an hour or right. two, but many times we're trying to again because we care about quality and telling the story in a way visually, as well as as audibly, um, we'll want to do a, some special lighting effect or something. Half the time we start doing it without really knowing what we're doing, <laughs> but you sort of have an idea in your head, so you try some stuff. And I mean that neural feedback we set up for a couple of days, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, what, what made that com- so complex? I mean, what was the Jeff wanted to hang fluorescent tubes by themselves from the ceiling, and we had no idea how to do that. And, nice. so, <laughs> and so it took a while to figure out. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, but it but the effect, he had very clearly in his head what you wanted that effect to be, and so it took us a while to, you know, and a couple of guys messing around to figure out a way to do it. And the effect is there. If you look at the piece, it's it's really strong, and it and it adds not only to the drama and the emotion of the piece, but to the story as well. Hmm. And I should say that that's something that I think is, is really cool about, um, about Josh and Martin and our bosses on up that they allow us to try a lot of these creative things. I mean, we get no's a lot too, yep. but like if we, if we push it too far, we, but you know, but, but there's a lot of things that we get uh, yeses for and a lot of like creative flexibility, um, to try things, not just in like, oh, we want to go bigger with it, but just in terms of just trying something different. Yeah. We, w- we want to try and get creative with this. We don't want to present the same thing every time. If somebody is, cons- you know, if there are, you know, uh, for, for the people that do consistently watch uh, our stuff, we don't want them to see the same thing every time yeah. either. Yeah. Um, and it presents you in new and unique ways of being able to get the story across. Yeah, if I had to liken it to a sermon, <laughs> then it would be like, if we do it all at the same time, it would, it would just be monotone, mm. you know? We want to, and what we want to do is add more inflection and, and raise our voice and and just be engaging. And that's why we're trying to present the stories creatively. In part of the well told part is um, just making sure it's engaging hmm. and that you know it's not boring and um, keeping up with the times as well. You know, yeah. It it reminds me. There's a lot of parallels between that and like what we do for events and stuff right. at like WII, trying to get the stage set just right, right or right. like tri- a lot of trial and error and stuff um, yeah. to try to make it as best as it possibly can be. Right. It's like it's a team effort, and it's it's people kind of specializing in their in their craft and their area, and and it's probably just as chaotic. Sometimes it feels as chaotic with people running in and and the guy putting sandbags on everything or whatever yeah there was a reason gaff tape was invented (laughs) and it was to fill a lot of those holes when you're like we're not exactly sure how this is going to work and the same is true with the live events yeah it's the same kind of thing which we you know we we provide input on a lot of that stuff too you're like i don't know how we're going to do this but here's the what's in my head and then we sort of try and figure out a way to get it out of your head and into the onto the stage or into the camera in our Mm. case yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think we kind of touched on this, but uh, we said you're, you're, you said your crews are usually about four. What's like the biggest crew you guys have needed like on a shoot? Like, so um. every so often we have the uh, the opportunity to do a narrative piece, okay. something that isn't a documentary. We'll do a few of those in a year. Those ones always will have a bigger crew. Hmm. Um, the the biggest crew we probably had. Well, I don't know, Jeff, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we released a, a, a short film earlier this year that was a, a modern retelling of The Prodigal Son that, that Jeff directed. Um, it was shot mostly um, in the UK, actually. Um, was that a bigger crew than we would have had mm-hmm. elsewhere? Mm-hmm. And that was how big? That was still pretty stripped down, but that was a crew of uh, eight, eight people, maybe, with a handful of different talent. But I think that some of the bigger ones were the local uh, John Gowan's poems yeah. ones where we actually had like, you know, 20, cr- 20 people yeah. as crew on like Vagrant or Survival, I think. Yeah. Door less so. Survival probably, yeah, mm-hmm. was a little bit bigger too. Yeah, we yeah. did a, we did a series of little narrative takes of using um, Gowan's poetry 
uh, and sort of setting it to some to visuals. Jeff did a series of those, did three of those, and those because again that every, the whole world has to be created essentially uh, require more people and more more time. So those ones, yeah, were probably a little bigger. But our average crew size on most of our shoots is probably four. Yeah. Wow. Especially if you're traveling, sh traveling shoots. Yes. Yeah. Just like three, four, something like that, right. depending. And know. each one of those guys got a lot to do. There's a lot to yep. do for each one of those. There yep. is. That's really, that's pushing it. That's right. They're working real hard. Right. Like you were saying, it's stripped down. So like on a movie set, whatever, it'd be uh, like a big budget Hollywood set. It'd be a bunch of people. Kind oh, of like, like uh, hundreds. Yeah. 50 or 100. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. 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 Easily. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, what is, what was the hardest story, I guess, to shoot logistically for you guys? Like, I mean, to location wise or, or just coordination, you know, that's a good question. I got to do a piece that's not released yet. Um, it's, it's top <laughs> secret, you heard it here first. <laughs> but, uh, but we shot it and, uh, in it, we, it, it's a narrative piece and in it we had to, um, maximize our location so i wanted them to come in out from this certain interior onto the street hmm. um we shot that here at crestmont and there's no street it's just parking lot so we had this huge 12 12 foot green screen um so she comes out of the door into a green screen and then we had to splice that take with the with an, another shot, so that just took a lot of planning. Hmm. The whole piece is all one long track. So it's it's shot. one take, by yeah. the way. Yeah, it's it's a oneer, as we call it, yeah. <laughs> which is the camera doesn't stop rolling right. the whole time, and so it looks seamless because it just goes to the green screen and then um, goes out to a street to another shot, which we shot the next day. It's hmm. awesome. That was technically difficult. Jeff just took a crew at the beginning of this year to the Marshall Islands. That was probably difficult for different reasons. Right. So. Yeah, that was that was that was intense, and um, yeah, so it was three of us for three weeks in the Marshall Islands, and um, one of those was on um, the atoll of of Jalouet, which has um, no cell service, no electricity, no running water. Yeah. Well, one island has a generator, but um, you know, so you're basically you're 100 percent off the grid for a week. We're sleeping on um, the ground in the open air chapel and yeah. that kind of thing, um, which is just very different, you know, just very, very uh, stretching in terms of just, I think what we're used to. Um, but God, it was so cool. It was so cool. Yeah. It was so cool to see um, and to be able to, it's just like everywhere you point the camera is, is fantastic. And um, I think those experiences really, you know, stretch you and um, also shine a light on the, this, really truly remote corner of the world in the South Pacific, tiny little Island in the South Pacific where the Salvation Army is thriving hmm. really. Um, but we wouldn't know it because it's such a pain to get there and no one goes there. I think it's somewhere in the bottom 10, like least visited countries in the world hmm. each year. Um, but the Salvation Army has been there for like 30 years or something like that. And they, they have a very significant role in the culture there yeah and it's, it's cool it's cool to see i get the sense that there's you guys aren't just um there's a f strong film like vibe from you guys but there's also maybe you guys have i mean i'm sure you guys have talked about it but there's also a strong journalistic kind of vibe to what you guys do as well i mean you just you just went out on location to you know to something that i would imagine a guy who's being sent out to be like embedded with like you know a, in another country or whatever doing stuff like that so there's a very like strong I and mean, you're like kind of meshing the two worlds together which is kind of cool um but yeah it's awesome that's all right well you guys thank you so much for being here just for um sharing your insight with us and uh it was great i feel like i learned a lot yeah. about share change and storytelling um if you are listening and you're interested in learning more about Share Change or watching more of their pieces, we'll be sure to link um, below or in the show, show notes um, some information about Share Change. Um, you can visit helpsharechange.org. You can also find them on social media at Share Change on Facebook or Help Share Change on Instagram. Am yeah, I missing any any channels? Out. They put a lot of work. <laughs> and yeah, this stuff is great. And one other thing that might be useful for for your youth worker folks is all of our pieces um, are available for download from our website. So each piece is there. It's all searchable by keyword and it's categorized as well. Um, they make great little 
program bits in the middle of a meeting, you know, whether it's at mm. a camp meeting or a core meeting or a youth group or whatever it is. If you want to know more about what the Army is doing for recovery or for families or for seniors, we have pieces that cover all of those topics. And some of them are just quick and fun. We've done little meme, meme videos and things as well. Uh, and they're all very easy to download and put into your presentations for events or whatever whatever you've got going on. We use it at YI. We use it some pieces. Yeah, we did this stuff. year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. it was really great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely check them out. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Say Network podcast on iTunes or on YouTube um, to receive notifications just to make sure that you don't miss an episode. And thanks for listening. We'll be back with a brand new episode soon. Mm -hmm.